Hello everyone, Jolene here from Bookworm Adventure Girl. Welcome back. And if you are new, thanks so much for checking out my channel. Please hit subscribe and stick around. Today is a good day to stick around because I am doing something a little bit different than usual. Uh, I mentioned in one of my earlier videos, probably a couple weeks ago, that I was going to be having a special guest. And today I have the honor to chat with one of this year's Giller Prize jury members, Wabgishik Rice. And many of you know that I follow the Giller Prize, um, which is awarded annually for the best Canadian fiction. And I have already talked about all of the jury members. I've talked about the long list and the short list. Um, so I'm going to leave links to all of those videos in the description box below so that if you want to learn more, um, you can go and check those out. Uh, you can see that I have displayed the shortlisted Giller books uh, from this year. I don't have Rawi Hage's short story collection, uh, Stray Dogs. I read that as a library copy, um, but the others are here. And Wob is someone many of you will already be familiar with. Um, I've talked about Wob and his books uh, many, many times on my channel. And he's someone that I have a lot of respect and admiration for, uh, for his writing, of course, and his journalism, um, but then also just who he is as a human being. So if you have ever wondered what it would be like to be a Giller jury member, or maybe you've you know wondered what the process is like to narrow down over a hundred books to a long list and then the short list and then one book. Um, and if you want to learn more about who Wob is, then stay tuned because I am going to be asking Wob all about it. So here we go. Welcome everyone. As you can see, we have a special guest with us today. Today we have um, journalist, writer, dad, husband and Giller Prize uh, jury member for this year, Wapkishik Rice. Welcome. It's very nice to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Jolene. Really happy to be here. Um, as you know, I'm a huge fan. I follow you on social media. We first met, and I don't know if you'll remember this, probably not, um, at The Fold, the Festival of Literary Diversity in Brampton in 2019. So that's when I first found out who you were. And I tell my viewers, whenever I talk about you and your books, I always say that we affectionately call you Wob. Mm -hmm. And so you're okay if I continue to call you Wob? Yes, I'm totally fine with that. Thanks. Okay, no problem. Um, so as you know, um, I love Canadian literature. I follow the Giller Prize. I follow Canada Reads. I follow basically anything <laughs> that is Canadian literature. And I try to keep up. There's a lot. Yeah, like there's a lot. And I think the Giller Prize, um, especially, really shows how much because you had to read over 130 <laughs> books. <laughs> um, so that right there, I'm like, I read probably about 120 to 150 books a year. Wow. So to think that 130 books is what you had to read throughout the year, just for this one prize is pretty impressive. Um, so thank you for doing that, by the way. <laughs> oh, it, it was an honor and a pleasure. And yeah, it was a big stack. But, you know, fortunately, I think we worked as a team to get through it and uh, ended up, I think, in a pretty good place. And it was just a major career and life highlight for me to serve on the jury. It's fantastic. So we are coming from two different places. So I thought maybe we could share with people who are watching where we are coming from. Mm -hmm. um, the sun is just rising where I am, and I am coming from uh, Mokinsis, which is Blackfoot territory, and as we call Calgary now. Um, and it is also home to Métis Nation 3. And I have the privilege of looking out at the Bow River every oh. day. Yeah, so it's quite lovely here. And I am a guest on this land, fairly new guest. I've only been here just over a year. Mm -hmm. Um, before that, I was closer to you. Would you like to share where you were coming from this morning? Yes, I am in Sudbury, Ontario, which is also known as Swakamuk. It's the traditional territory of Atikamikshing Nishnabek. 
I'm looking out at a fairly overcast day, but with very mild temperatures. Uh, all the snow has pretty much melted, given this weird, um, weird fall we've been having. Oh, and I, sh I should mention where I live now uh, and where I'm originally from, which is called Wasoxing First Nation, are lands that are part of the Robinson Huron Treaty, which was signed in 1850. And that, of course, makes it a treaty that predates Canadian Confederation. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, mild uh, day here in Sudbury. Um, very strange to see the snow go already because here it usually lands on the ground in November and doesn't leave until April. But I guess we'll take uh, the little break. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to get a whopping snowfall mm -hmm. this weekend. Um, I was at something the other day and one of our elders said, be prepared for this winter and I went okay I'm listening I'm listening <laughs> so winter tires went on yesterday um I do still need to go get some snow boots or some winter yeah. boots I say yeah snow tires winter boots um and just be prepared because I thought oh you know what you're talking about I'm gonna pay attention <laughs> so, um <laughs> so Wab I have a couple of your books I don't have legacy I still need to pick that one up and, and read that. But I do have Midnight Sweat Lodge. Oh, cool. Yeah, um, which I really enjoyed. And I have, I think the one that you're probably most well known for, Moon of the Crusted Snow. Mm. And I know that the sequel is coming out next year. Yeah. Yeah. Do, when, do you have a publication date for it? Yeah, uh, right now they've set October 10th of 2023, and it'll be out under the Random House imprint of Penguin Random House Canada, and I am working to get that last draft in, and uh, we'll be going to copy editing probably in January, and then everything else to follow, you know, design, cover, and all that, so it's uh, it's starting to get real, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Do we wait all the way till October? Okay, I can yeah. do it. Um, <laughs> this is, um, this is going to, you're going to know, uh, this, you're going to recognize this for sure. Another author that I talk about a lot on my channel, and I know that you were friends with is, um, Richard Wagamese. Oh, so yeah. I know that you wrote the introduction to this newest publication of the two novellas. Yeah. So I had that on my shelf and I thought, well, I didn't have your third book. So I'll grab that and oh, nice. show that. So, yeah, that, that yeah. was, you know, it was, it was lovely to be able to write that for, for that reissue. Is, is very very nice excellent and I, that's one I still have to read so um I usually read a few of Richard Wagamese's books a year oh cool and a part of me doesn't want to read them too quickly yeah because I don't want it to end <laughs> but yeah. then I also always love um always love his books and right now one of his books is in my top for the year so we'll see how oh. Reagan, I read Reagan Company this year oh nice and loved it yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was really good. Okay, so back to Giller, because that's what we're here for. Um, so I guess, you know, my first question is, um, how were you chosen as one of the jury members? And have you done this kind of thing before? Have you been a jury member on any of the prizes before? Um, or was this your first time? Yeah, I was the uh, on the jury for the Writers Trust Fiction Prize in 2020. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was my first sort of taste of that intense sort of reading uh, regimen and then, you know, the lively discussions around literature. And I think that experience really primed me for, for this one. And when Ilana Rabinovich reached out to me last fall, it was probably about a year ago, uh, actually, she invited me to serve on the jury. Um, it, you know, was really uh, an easy decision. Um, not just given, you know, the experience that I already had, but obviously also the prestige around the Giller Prize. And um, I've known Ilana, you know, not super well, but just, you know, casually for a few years. And uh, I know of some of my peers who've served on the jury who had nothing but good things to say about the experience. Uh, and I was just really excited when she reached out. And uh, yeah, it, it's really hard to believe that it was a year ago. But, um, you know, looking back, it was just a uh, yeah, so phenomenal overall. It's fantastic. And I have to say, I've been following the Giller for a number of years. And I think this is, I want to say the first year, I'm sure it's not the first year, but the first year where people really loved the jury members and really <laughs> loved, um, really loved the choices that were made. Like sometimes, you know, there's like controversy, like they shouldn't have chosen this one. And there really wasn't the controversy this year that I saw out there. People were just like, this is a solid group of people picking solid books for solid reasons. I think there was Good just on. a 
huge trust. Yeah. For people who love Canadian literature. And I thought that that was fantastic. And I really only know um, three of the judges fairly well because I know that two of them were from the States. Hmm. Um, so I thought that was, that's an interesting mix too, to have some, some people from other countries to be part of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so how, so you had to read 130 books. Does everyone have to read all of the books or can you divvy it up? Like, Hey, you take 50 and you take 50. <laughs> I'll do 10. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, it, it's, it goes without saying that reading 138 books in about a 10 month span would require like a full-time schedule, right? Ah. So not everybody reads every page of every single book. We do split up the responsibilities, you know, maybe at some point, uh, one of the jurors will go ahead on, on one book and then, you know, get through it and say, okay, you know, make sure the rest of you uh, read this one all the way through because I think we should discuss it, right? So um, it was a matter of like uh, some people tackling some others first and then, you know, going on the recommendations of others. And then when we would highlight those particular books that we thought were worthy of discussion, we would, you know, convene on Zoom and then talk about them a little more thoroughly, right? Uh, so yeah, that that's basically how it went. And, you know, a pretty... Um, I wouldn't call it democratic because we weren't really like voting on anything during those uh, initial readings and discussions, but it was pretty organic. You know, it was more or less seeking what we really thought were good stories written really well. And uh, the discussions that followed were, were really, really interesting. I bet I wanted to be a fly on the wall for those discussions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, I- yeah, the the long the discussion for the long list was was really interesting. It, it went really long. Uh, it was probably well, no, the 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 discussion to pick the winner was the hardest one, but the second hardest one was for sure the long list. Um, given the volume of books, obviously, I think we had uh, a bigger task. Uh, and originally, I think we were aiming for about ten. But we kept saying, oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? And then 10 quickly turned to 12. And then by the end of the two plus hours, it was 14, right? So. Yeah, you surprised me with that. (laughs) (laughs) Because I do a prediction. Yeah. And it's been 12, traditionally 12 in the past. And when I picked my 12 and then when there was 14, I was like, oh, I could have included two others. I had no (laughs) idea. So you tricked me on that, um, which was fantastic. I mean, the more books that we can get out there and, you know, show off, like, why wouldn't we? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think it's fantastic. And like I said, I think, you know, I wasn't part of that process, but you did a fantastic job because there were some really good books that were up this year for the Geller. And uh, yeah, I can't even imagine trying to choose. I feel like they're all my babies and I don't want to, you know, toss any away. So yeah. <laughs> but it's good that you, uh, that you guys did a great job. Thank you. Um, so one of our, um, one of my viewers and a fellow booktuber, uh, Lindy from Magpie Reads, uh, she sent a couple of questions and she was also, we did a shadow giller. So there cool. were three of us reading the short list um, her and Penny and myself, and we uh, were trying to choose, and we we actually did choose. We we, we chose um, Suzette Mirror's book. Um, oh. Yeah, we did. <laughs> so that way was really good. But um, we didn't have to read 130 some books. We were just reading the short list, and then we had a very quick discussion about who the winner would be, and we all had the same top three. Oh, wow. So I, yes, which I thought was pretty good. And so um, I think when it came down to just choosing, I felt like any of them had an argument, mm-hmm. you know, like I was like, I could argue for any of these books. So it was really easy for me to say, because two, the two of them, I will, I have to confess, two of them chose this one. I chose a different one for my top one, but I totally understood why they would choose this. So, so I was like, yeah, I'm okay with it. You know? And then when it won, I'm like, man, <laughs> I went with that one. Um, but one of Lindy's questions was if you um, used any kind of rubric to help like figure out which books that you were, you know, judging and how you were going to do that. It was there a structure um, of the evaluation for it, because that's the thing. It's always like, are you looking for a certain type of writing? Are you looking for a certain type of story or theme or something like that? So I don't know if you can talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, the interesting thing is there was no objective criteria whatsoever, you know, okay. no set guidelines that were handed over to us by, you know, the Giller executives or um, anybody else connected to it. Basically, they just said, you know, pick the best book, you know, um, what you enjoy, what you appreciate, the the best writing and so on. So there wasn't like, uh, you know, these things to flag like plot or character or anything else like that you know so uh, in that sense I think it unfolded in a really organic way and because you know we each wanted to sort of highlight what we appreciated about each book and you know why the rest of Canada should read it uh, I think our conversations ended up being very celebratory uh, of each of the books and of course like when it came down to making some final decisions you know we would discuss you know what maybe didn't work in some book and you know maybe why another book should be slightly ele elevated over another you know that's just natural that has to happen in in a process like this right uh but no there was no sort of uh, set guidelines and i think with all five of us coming into it didn't sort of proclaim you know our uh own personal criteria or you know what our sort of values were or anything like that you know so uh, those things emerged though like within the conversations over the course of like nine months um but it, it was really neat to see how the the 14 and then the five and then the one emerged and after so many months of chatting with the same people about books, you know, you sort of predict who's going to champion what or who's going to say what. And, um, you know, if you really want to champion something else, you know, what your rebuttal to them, you know, maybe would be and so on. So it, it was fun, like in that sense, too. So there are maybe some debates and I use debates in a friendly way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, there are some debates and I guess that was, you know, one of my questions is how did you work together? But it sounds like it was pretty respect respectable and that you were able to have those kind of conversations in a in a good way because everyone has the same goal I guess um yeah. and so what was the process of people disagreed uh you know <laughs> I think um if someone disagreed uh you know everybody else would acknowledge it or uh, and maybe that disagreement too would be a factor in you know future conversations too uh, you know, you'd be discussing one book and then remember, oh, uh, Juror X didn't like this about that or whatever else, right? right. Um, and maybe that became like a preface to some of the discussions too. You know, you'd say, oh, you know, uh, Juror Y, I know how you feel about this, but hear me out on this and, and so on, you know? Uh, and yeah, there, there were like lively discussions for sure, but, you know, there was never any sort of negativity or animosity. Um, and I think the the good thing is, is that, uh, and this is probably part of how we were chosen as jurors, is that, you know, none of us had any real uh, skin in the game um, with any of the books or the publishers or whatever. Sure, we've been published by some of the different publishers and some of the yeah. people are, are our friends and so on. <laughs> uh, and we would, we would declare that too, obviously, going into it. Um, but yeah, just the, the basic sort of criteria of the most interesting story that's the best written, I think, is really what steered us all to, to where we needed to get to. Excellent. I thought about that because I know that you're friends with some of the people on that list. And I thought, oh, how do you do that? You know, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a tricky not, thing for sure. Not going to lie. That, that was that was hard. In some, yeah, that in would some, be hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then the winner is chosen the morning of the announcement. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 That I I don't know why that surprised me this year. I I don't know if I didn't know that in the past. I, it was it seemed new to me and I was like you just figured that out this morning. Like I'm thinking you are you're carrying around a secret for a couple of weeks at <laughs> least, you know, like we know and nobody else knows. Um so were the jury members in agreement going nope. into that conversation? Okay. Not at okay. all. Yeah. And they, um, I don't know if they've always done it that way, but they've definitely done it the last few years where the decision is made the day of. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is to prevent leaks, because, you know, <laughs> if we decided two months ago, you know, there may be some loose lips at some point, right? And uh, 
if it got out there, it wouldn't be a good thing at all, you know? So, um, uh, but that sort of added to like the fun and the intrigue of the whole process was knowing that we were going to decide that day. Uh, but all, all five of us, um, were still in touch regularly from the moment we picked the shortlist until the winter, which was almost two months essentially. And, um, no, it was only about a month and a half actually. Uh, but we would email and say, you know, so who, which one are you thinking or which one are you thinking? And people's minds changed like over the course of that, that period. But when we sat down the, that morning, uh, I think 10 o'clock is when we convened in the hotel there. Uh, we each had a different number one. Uh, each of us wow. had one of the books that we wanted to win. And uh, so right away, we're like, we're going to be here for a while. <laughs> this is going to take a bit. So we, you know, um, I, I should give credit to Casey, obviously, as the chair uh, who started, you know, directing us to where we needed to go. And Kai really had a, a good hand in sort of, you know, applying some administrative tasks to that. <laughs> Like you don't yeah. think about like weighted ballots or or anything like that going into it, but it, you sort of require something like that if there's no consensus whatsoever from the get go, you know. And it ended up being about a three and a half hour discussion uh, to get to uh, the sleeping guard porter as as champion. But in the end, it was something we all wholeheartedly agreed on, and we believed it was the best choice. We believed that was the book that deserved to win the Giller Prize. And I think that's how that emerged through this, through the discussion, you know, um, and it was really cool from start to finish to see how that happened. It's an excellent book. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I went to between the pages, um, which I actually oh, just cool. happened. Yeah. It happened just a couple blocks from where I live. Um, and when Suzette Mirror walked in, and of course this is, you know, before the announcement, um, you could tell she's well loved here and just, yeah, like, I can imagine that the literary world exploded here in Calgary when yeah. she was announced. Um, I was very pleased. And um, yeah, I, I can just imagine. I can, you know, from, just from social media, it looks like her life is changing already. Mm -hmm. And that she's, she's definitely brought, um, you know, um, some some new eyes, I think, to this story because, you know, it's, yeah. there's some historical uh, historical relevance to it. And, uh, and a story that we don't really hear a whole lot of. So um, just in that, I think it's fantastic. And uh, yeah, so it, it, I was pretty excited. Were there any books that didn't make the long list? This is, I know this is tricky. It would be tricky for me. So um, were there any that didn't make the long list that you enjoyed and that you would recommend? So this okay. is me allowing you to add even more to the long list. <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate that opportunity. Uh, you know, I think if if I had my say, uh, and this would have been totally unrealistic, but, you know, I would have been happy with a, a 20 book long list, you know, uh, throwing a few more on there. Uh, yeah, there were a lot that didn't didn't get on that I think, you know, could have could have. Um, but that I loved nonetheless. Uh, one of them was uh, a collection called Uncertain Kin by Janice Lynn uh, Mather. I think is how you pronounce her last name. Uh, just a, a really cool short story collection um, that I think really challenged some, I guess, literary conventions uh, and also, you know, um, homed in on a way of life or a culture that we may not necessarily see a lot of in, in mainstream literature, which is great. Uh, another one was uh, Lisa Moore's This Is How We Love. Uh, and what I what I really appreciated about that one is it was m a more contemporary story um, set uh, during that big blizzard in Newfoundland a, a few winters ago, um, and just you know a particular family story. Um, I, I really uh, enjoyed that. Uh, another one was a collection by David Hubert uh, called Chemical Valley. Uh, and it was sort of leaning more towards like the speculative fiction side. Uh, and, you know, that's sort of the world I'm in at the moment. And that's what I really appreciated. And that's what I, you know, going back to the shortlist, uh, that's what I appreciated about uh, lesser known monsters of the 21st century as well. You know, um, it, uh, it, it's been, I think, quite rare over the Giller history to have speculative fiction, you know, make it that far. And, and it was pretty cool to see that. Yes, there's hope for your October book. Oh, well, I, <laughs> no, uh, I, I appreciate the thought, but having read all these books and the caliber of the writing, like I am not there, but uh, you know, I'm happy to be the one reading and making the, the decisions for sure. 
<laughs> I I think you have to give yourself a little bit more credit. Oh, I, uh, thank I think you. So. Yeah. Thank you. Um, those are all really great. I loved the short story. I, short story collections aren't always they're like a hit or miss for me. Mm. So sometimes I'm like, oh no, these are out. And so to have two in the short uh, list was great. Mm-hmm. And I really loved um, Kim Fu's collection. Mm-hmm. I thought it was fantastic. And it was my choice. Was it? Yeah. <laughs> it was my choice because I also chose how to pronounce knife a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. And was ex- was like ecstatic when uh, Stephen Cam won. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, wouldn't it be great if another one won? So that's why I kind of led that way. Um, but Sleeping Car Porter was fantastic. Mm-hmm. So um, was there anything that surprised you that you weren't maybe expecting? Um, in your whole experience of being a jury member? Uh, I, w- I guess I was a little surprised by some of the discussions we had and how maybe they didn't necessarily go too deep into the weeds in terms of, as I mentioned, like literary technique or, or conventions or, you know, um, methodologies or anything like that because I don't have a literary background I have a journalism background that's what I went to university for and I think I became a writer a fiction writer more or less by reading a lot and sort of by adapting you know my own storytelling principles uh, from my culture and also from my journalism ex- experience into literature so that's how I came into this sort of realm and like I didn't I don't have a master's of fine arts and in, in creative writing or anything like that and I didn't I don't have an English degree so I'm not necessarily as like in tune with I think that world uh, but you know the focus of those discussions wasn't necessarily those things, which kind of surprised me a little bit because I, I, you know, I wondered, you know, what will I be able to offer uh, because I don't have a master's degree in in this sort of field, you know, but uh, it, it, it like the, the bulk of the discussions were about just what we loved about the story and how it was written. And I think that's what drew me to literature since I was a teenager, right? And I think that's what, also at the same time, that's what draws readers to literature too. You know, um, most readers in Canada don't have that sort of uh, background either. And they just want to read a, a good book that's written really well. And uh, having that as the focus of the discussions was uh, really energizing and really comforting. Uh, and also like really uh, eye-opening too. Um, uh, you know, that's not to say that we didn't talk about those things here and there, uh, you know, like, um, uh, like metaphor, allegory, whatever else, you know, those naturally come up for sure. But, um, yeah, just how, how I wouldn't say easygoing, but how natural and candid the conversations were, was, was really fun. And that could be, I guess, testament to how well we got to know each other. And just how great those other jurors are, you know, we we formed a pretty tight bond by the end. And uh, it was kind of sad, you know, when the broadcast was over and, you know, they're clearing off the tables. We were all getting ready to go our separate ways, right? After, you know, nine, ten months of uh, meeting pretty regularly. So, yeah, it, it was, yeah, just, just great to get to know everybody that way. Uh, that's actually, that's a great thing to surprise you, I think, because it also means that it's accessible to everyone else. Yeah. You know, if the short list was all this highbrow kind of thing, I think it would turn people off. Not that there's not a place in, for that. Yeah. And, um, but I just think then, you know, there's more readers and I think Canlit has come a long way. Yeah. Um, but it still has a ways to go as well. So I think that <laughs> these prizes and, you know, that kind of approach, I think allows it to continue to grow and more people yeah. find, yeah, to be accessible. I would um, say, just sorry, sorry, Jolene, just, just to add a little bit to that. Um, yeah. I think we were surprised, uh, and I, I'm comfortable saying this collectively, speaking for everyone else, um, uh, with the long list, how many indep- independent publishers were on there. And then by the short list, uh, all authors of color, you know, uh, we didn't set out to do that. Uh, that just emerged because... I guess, you know, uh, indirectly, we have our own values, too, that come out in our discussions. But we didn't say, oh, we need this many independent publishers on the long list, or we need this many authors of color on either list, right? Uh, That just happened because we were trying to highlight the best stories and the best books. Which is also fantastic and also showing how diverse Canlit can be. Mm -hmm. Um, It's one of the things that I love. Like, I always talk on my channel about Canadian literature and diverse reads. 
but there's so much diverse reading in Canadian literature itself. Yeah. It's pretty fantastic. So it's, it's neat that that just happened naturally. Mm -hmm. um, what about challenges? What was uh, the most challenging part for you as a jury member? Uh, I guess, you know, I did mention, you know, personal biases that we all obviously would have. Um, maybe putting some of those on the side when I was trying to champion a particular book or, or really advocating for a book's inclusion on whatever list, you know, um, because, you know, you really develop an emotional connection to a book if it's something specific to your background or, or very relatable mm -hmm. in some ways, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I guess, yeah, the difficult thing for me was separating some of that emotion and trying to be as objective as possible, uh, knowing what the ultimate goal was in the end for all of us, right? Um, but, you know, I, I worked as a journalist for a long time and I had to really force myself to do that on a daily basis, too, you know, especially when covering Indigenous communities and, and interviewing Indigenous people and so on. Um, but, you know, the I guess the good challenge was, as I mentioned earlier, trying to get to the long list. Uh, it was it was really, really hard, you know, figuring out, you know, the, the 14 books. Um, well, you know, it wasn't hard figuring out, you know, obviously we had the ones that we knew we're going to go far and we're going to be included on the list regardless. But I think it was like the last, I don't know, six, seven slots and figuring out, you know, where to put which book. And then as I mentioned earlier, extending the long list too, uh, that, that was pretty challenging for sure. And, and that ended up being one of the more intense discussions. Definitely. I wondered that, like, you know, sometimes I read a book and I'm like, this is going to make it in my top of the year you know <laughs> so like you know if you, it makes me feel a little I don't know it makes me feel good knowing that you you know would read a book and go yep that's one you know that's gonna be a long list for sure mm -hmm. um and whether or not everyone agreed on that or not that's a different thing but just to know that this is definitely going to be in it and then probably the same is true where it's like nope not this one right mm -hmm. <laughs> so you know like there's yeah. both ends of that spectrum but so that's a that's a good thing and I mean there was a like I said a lot to choose from so that's that's great um what is something that you learned from being a jury member that might help you with your own um, your own writing, either the book that you're currently writing or I'm hoping more books? Oh, so much. It's, it's, yeah. it's just been an invaluable experience for me. And, and this goes back to my, uh, my serving on the Writer's Trust jury too. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're that immersed in fiction, uh, you absorb so much. You know, you, uh, for me, it really brought me back to, uh, what got me passionate about fiction in the first place, you know, uh, and, and what really inspired me to try to find my own voice in that sort of style of, of creativity. And when you're reading novel after novel after novel and really, you know, focusing in on what you like or what you think works or what really connects with you, uh, you can't help but I think feel bolstered or empowered by just that experience, you know, by absorbing all of that great storytelling. So, uh, you know, it, it may not result in me sitting down and saying, okay, I want to write this part this way because I read it in that book, but uh, I'll write something and then I'll come back to it back to it and say, okay, you know, like I, I recall reading something similar and that helped me work through this particular part, or that helped me highlight this detail about this character, or that helped me sort of uh, steer, you know, the plot in this direction or whatever else. Right. So yeah, when you're immersed in a world like that, uh, you can't help but benefit from it. So having those two experiences within a three year uh, period was essentially like my master's degree, I guess, you know, <laughs> but I'll always, you know, just cherish uh, the, both of those experiences and especially this one, because, you know, I feel like um, slightly more experienced, you know, I feel like I have a better idea of what kind of writer I want to be or how I want to convey a story. And a big part of that is just the result of reading, you know, some of the best books that, you know, will ever be produced in this country, right? Like what, what a privilege it has been to be able to just dive into all of this story. That totally makes sense to me. I mean, I'm not a writer, 
but even just as a reader, you know, knowing when you're reading something really, really good and then knowing when you're reading something that isn't as good. Um, And so as a writer, I can only imagine, you know, kind of going, oh, that's how I want to write or that's not how I want to (laughs) write. So, um, yeah, I can imagine that being really rewarding. And um, yeah, because just as a reader, I also read differently. You know, I think Mm -hmm. I would read differently if I were judging officially <laughs> you know something um because you're looking at everything yeah and you're, you're almost hypersensitive to everything if that makes sense um i yeah. think i would be that would be how i would probably approach it right same as if i'm going to write a paper mm-hmm. i read something differently than i would if i was just sitting on my couch reading <laughs> you know? yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah well the totally- other thing too is that like you have to anticipate what the other jury members are going to think about it. It's, you know, especially when you get to the point where you know them pretty well. Uh, and then recency bias is another thing too, uh, that I, th- another surprising element to it all is the books that I loved early on didn't necessarily have the legs to the end to mm-hmm. compare it to some of the other ones we read that were submitted later on. Right. Um, so it's the same thing, as, as you say, like it's uh, as time goes on, you know, you, your attitudes change around a book and, um, for better or for worse, right? Which is another really fun part of it. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, Okay, so this one, this question that I have for you is a little bit different. But before the announcement of the winner, um, so I was watching it live, and they showed a number of Giller books that have been made into movies, been made into films. And I had never really thought about this before. There was quite a few (laughs) Canlet yeah. books made into films mm-hmm. and so I wondered if you either had a favorite that you wanted to talk about or is there one that you would like to besides um you know Moon of the Crescent Snow <laughs> <laughs> but is there one that you would like to be made into a film that hasn't been made yet oh good good question I was also surprised I was yeah. sitting there watching that montage and I was like wow <laughs> I had no idea some of these books ended up being uh adapted mm-hmm. um you know, one book that will stay with me for the rest of my life that I would love to see adapted in some capacity is uh, American War by oh. Omar al Uh I think it would be like an epic sort of movie. It'd probably have to be a series, actually, just given how big that book is, right? Um, but yeah, that 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 really uh, hit home for me in, in a lot of different ways. And uh, I would love to see how you know a, a director or a producer would would turn that into a series hopefully that would be cool that would be cool that would be cool do you have a favorite that's already out there oh I'm trying to think off the top of my head i know um, it's okay if you don't because there's a lot i just <laughs> yeah um you know like this is the, the, this is sort of tough to to discuss or highlight because uh, it's a very heavy story, but uh, the adaptation of Indian Horse by Richard Wagamese, I think, is, <sighs> is is good that it's been done because that was a huge dream of his, you know, to have that book adapted. And, and you know, it's it's really tragic that he didn't get to see it himself. But the fact that it's out there is, I think, pretty huge at the same time. Uh, and, you know, it's if you've seen it or your viewers have seen it, you know, very traumatic, you know, some very shocking imagery and moments. Um, but, uh, you know, just to know f- for the reason that he wanted to see it, I think is, is really special to consider overall that uh, his dream came true, you know, posthumously, which is great. Yes, my viewers, if they've been watching for, I don't know, a minute, they, they definitely know about Indian Horse, uh, the book. And I'm sure I've probably mentioned the film as well. Um, It's an incredible book. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, how are they going to to put this into a film and still capture that same emotion and just, and I think they did that quite well. Mm -hmm. Um, It is one of, it's one of, because sometimes, you know, the book is always better. That's what we always say. (laughs) Sometimes there are exceptions, but I would say in this case, they did an equal, um, they paid it justice. And I thought it was pretty equal. Um, it was very well done. So good choice, Wab, good choice. <laughs> um, so you have so much going on. Like when I, so this is, I'm glad that you said that you didn't read all 130 books because I thought, how is this guy, <laughs> you know, balancing his life? Like you're, you have a family, your work, 
and you have many other interests. Um, you have, you know, I know that you're into martial arts um, and you're into rock music. I know you go to concerts and you like things like that. Like, how do you manage to balance all of that? And, and what is next for you? What are, what are you working on? I know you have your book um, mm -hmm. in, that's coming out in October, as you said, but what, what else is going on for you? I think, I think balance for me really is uh, having some great support at home. You know, my wife is, is very encouraging in me pursuing my dreams, but also making sure I'm able to have a good time too. like go to concerts with my buddies and stuff like that. <laughs> and, and also like go to work out, go do jujitsu, you know, making time for that. Uh, you know, <laughs> It's, I don't want to sound like, uh, you know, ungrateful or facetious in any way, but a big part of where I'm at now was quitting my day job, you know, at CBC, of, of quitting my career as a journalist to be able to pursue a lot of these literary endeavors. And it's been two and a half years now since I, I left CBC, uh, but that opened up so many different possibilities for me. And I think it provided me the autonomy to pick and choose, to set my own schedule, and to sort of decide when I want to work and, and what projects to take on and so on, right? So, you know, for the past year, um, you know, I'd, I'd originally set this year aside just to finish the novel um, and take on some other uh, opportunities here and there, some, some smaller ones. So when the Giller opportunity arose, um, you know, it, it was a bit of a tough call, but thankfully, I think, the way my editor uh, and I work um, is, you know, back and forth, you know, a couple months at a time. So there'd be moments where I'd give a draft back to him and then I had all this time to do Giller reading, which was great. And, and I was able to, I think, devote a lot of time to reading um, a lot of the books. And, and then, yeah, from there, just, you know, having uh, another part of it, too, uh, was, you know, my wife going back to work and our kids being in school and daycare and and having the house to myself to do, you know, a lot of work and a lot of reading, too. Um, so, yeah, it's just a combination of things that I'm really fortunate to have and, and very grateful for, too. You know, like it is. It is living a dream in, in a lot of ways. And, you know, I don't want to take it for granted at all, for sure, you know. Um, but yeah, I think uh, going ahead, uh, as mentioned, um, we're hoping to wrap the book up within the next few months, uh, editorially anyway. Like the big revisions are pretty much done. And from here, it's just going to be some copy editing and stuff. But the biggest thing happening for us is another baby coming in February. So uh, that's going to be... Um, you know, a, a huge change, but a very uh, beautiful one too. So for, I think most of the winter, I'll just be, you know, stay at home dad. Uh, and then once the spring picks up, I have some speaking things here and there and some, some smaller casual writing things. And then getting ready for the big promo cycle of the next book in the fall, which will be pretty busy, but I'm really excited about it at the same time. That's excellent. And I think I'm sure you're missed at CBC. I, oh. I almost I like I'm sure that they were very sad, but I must say that I celebrated when you um, announced that because and it's been wonderful to see you just kind of blossom and come into your own like and that's from afar. That's like so I can only imagine what it's like in reality for you. Right. So it's been really interesting to see that happen and to see the things that you have taken on. So um, again, I think good choice, Wob, good choice. <laughs> <laughs> and I look forward to seeing where that journey continues to take you. Um, and yeah, congratulations. Uh, I know I said before we started recording, but congratulations on number three. It's number three. I'm very excited for you and your wife. Um, is there anything about the Giller experience that we haven't talked about that you would like to share? I just think it's it's a wonderful initiative. It promotes Canadian literature. Uh, it, it brings communities together to celebrate uh, literary storytelling. And, and in some ways, it really sets the tone for the discussions that we need to have um, as a society, as a country. And, and the winner is, I think, a great example of that. You know, as you mentioned, uh, Jolene, it, it's an experience that I didn't know about, not a lot of other Canadians know about, but it's an essential part of Canadian history, you know, and you know, just speaking for myself, not for everybody else, what I really, uh, I think, appreciated about that being the winner is 
you know, it, it will be canonized for sure. You know, this is the kind of book that's going to be taught in a lot of places. And, you know, having Suzette Mayer as, as a queer Black woman win it too, um, provides so much more exposure to, you know, communities that other Canadians may not necessarily uh, be a part of. So, yeah, like the influence is pretty, <laughs> is pretty huge to consider when you sit down and think, holy geez, we like, you know, <laughs> like you you, you you ignite a book in some ways right for lack of a better mm -hmm. sort of, uh, term but uh yeah that's and, and you know just sort of very fortunate very grateful to the Rabinovich family for uh, making this happen and uh it's just so cool to you know to talk with you about it and to chat with people online about how massive this whole prize is and just how um you know influential it is but also how people take it seriously but also how they appreciate it at the same time so so all those things you know like it's just been a wonderful year of all these uh this massive combination of um great feelings and great experiences excellent yeah i i love the giller i will continue to uh to follow it and it also opens my eyes to so many authors and books that i have never even heard of sometimes and I consider myself someone who follows Canadian literature, you know, a lot. And I know a lot of the writers and things. And then I'm, you know, all of a sudden there's this list of 130 books that I'm like, I've never heard of a lot of these people. Who are these people? So I love that about it as well. Um, and again, the diversity that's in it is fantastic. So congratulations again for being a fantastic jury member, <laughs> you and, and your other uh, four colleagues. And um, thank you, uh, Chimi Gwich for being here and for chatting with me about Giller. Um, I will continue to follow you, not stalk you, but to follow you <laughs> <laughs> online. Um, and I will leave, is it okay if I leave your social media links um, yeah, in the great. description box for people to follow? So I will do that as well. So Chimi Gwich again, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Oh, how Chimi Gwich, Jolene, this has been really fun. Thanks for having me on. Thanks again to everyone for watching. I hope that you enjoyed my chat with Wob and maybe learned something um, about the process of judging the Giller Prize. Uh, as I mentioned, I will leave all of Wob's social media links and contacts below. So please send him some uh, really good booktube love. And please let me know your thoughts. Uh, were you surprised maybe by anything that Wob shared and from our chat? Uh, was there anything that made you think? Uh, were there any books that were mentioned that you've read or would maybe like to read? Have you already started talking and thinking about next year's Giller Prize and who you would like to see on, on it? Um, I know that I'm definitely already watching what's kind of coming out in Canlit right now and seeing if there's any potentials out there. So as always, I look forward to chatting with you in the comments. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and don't forget to make every day an adventure.